Greetings and welcome to Q1 2024 Teradyne Inc. Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Tracy Suchiguchi, Vice President, Investor Relations. Thank you, Ms. Suchiguchi. You may begin. Thank you, Operator. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our discussion of Teradyne's most recent financial results. I'm joined this morning by our CEO, Greg Smith, and our CFO, Sanjay Mehta. Following our opening remarks, we'll provide details of our performance for the first quarter of 2024 and our outlook for the second quarter of 2024. The press release containing our first quarter results was issued last evening. We are providing slides on the investor page of our website that may be helpful in following the discussion. Replays of this call will be available via the same page after the call ends. The matters that we discussed today will include forward-looking statements that involve risks that could cause Teradyne's results to differ materially from management's current expectations. We caution listeners not to place undue reliance on any forward-looking statements included in this presentation. We encourage you to review the safe harbor statement contained in slides accompanying the, this presentation, as well as the risk factors described in our annual report on the 10K with the SEC. Additionally, these forward-looking statements are made only as of today. During today's call, we will make reference to non-GAAP financial measures. We have posted additional information concerning these non-GAAP financial measures, including reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP financial measure, where available on the Investor Relations page of our website. Looking ahead, between now and our next earnings call, Teradyne expects to participate in technology or investor-focused investor conferences hosted by J.P. Morgan, KeyBank, Cowan, Bernstein, and Stiefel. Following Greg and Sanjay's comments this morning, we'll open up the call for questions. This call is scheduled for one hour. Greg? Thanks, Tracy. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us this morning. Today, I will summarize our first quarter results and discuss some of the trends in the semiconductor industry and robotics that we believe position Teradyne for long-term growth. It is useful to comprehend these longer-term growth drivers because the industries in which we operate are inherently cyclical. Sanjay will then provide greater financial detail on our first quarter results, our current outlook, and additional financial information. We delivered first quarter financial results above our revenue, gross margin, and earnings guidance ranges. Memory and SOC delivered above our plan and showed strong performance in the quarter, driven primarily by AI applications. The impact of AI on our business was seen in networking as well as in edge AI applications like ADAS. Over 40% of our memory shipments in the first quarter were driven by AI applications. As we expected, mobile continued to be soft in the first quarter. Our robotics business delivered to plan for the third consecutive quarter as their go-to-market execution continues to improve. Moving on to Q2, the impact of AI on test demand we experienced in the first quarter is continuing into the second quarter, improving our outlook in memory and in compute. However, a meaningful upturn in mobile, legacy auto, and industrial end markets may not occur until the 2025 timeframe. Looking ahead, within the semiconductor test market, we expect that the Compute TAM, which includes networking in many vertically integrated producers, to grow at a faster pace than previously expected. We now estimate the Compute TAM in 2024 to be 1.5 billion, up from 1.4 billion. We have lowered our TAM estimates for auto, industrial, and mobile markets as recovery in these end markets appears to be pushing out in time. With the combination of our stronger first half and limited visibility into the second half, our estimate of the 2024 SOC TAM remains unchanged at 3.6 to 4.2 billion. In memory test, we are increasing our expectation of TAM growth to 1.2 to 1.3 billion from our prior estimate of 1 to 1.1 billion, driven mainly by stronger demand for HBM, which we expect to grow 5x last year's level. As I'm sure you've noticed, our first quarter results and second quarter expectations are significantly above our view from January. For the full year at the company level, we continue to expect low single digit growth from 2023. In January, we are expecting the year to be back half loaded with mobile driving that recovery. 
We also shared that lead times were decreasing and our visibility was limited. The sustained strength and new demand in AI-driven applications are boosting our business in the first half. However, we are being cautious on the second half on what looks like continued weakness in the mobile market. Our operations team is continuing to enable us to pursue short lead time opportunities, so it certainly feels as if there's more upside opportunity than downside risk. Now turning to robotics. The first quarter is typically quite weak for our robotics business, and this year is no exception. We were very pleased to see the team deliver on plan and are expecting sequential growth in the second quarter. We are executing a plan which we expect to deliver 10 to 20 percent growth in 2024. This plan includes three elements. First is SAM expansion through new offerings. Second is growing our OEM solution provider and large account channels. Third is building increased recurring revenue through service and software offerings. In the first quarter, we made good progress in all of these areas. We executed on new SAM expanding initiatives with the announcement of UR's collaboration with NVIDIA and the new MIR 1200 pallet jack. We grew our UR OEM business 58% year on year, and we received the single largest order in the history of MIR from a strategic customer. Zooming out, we see AI as the transformational secular growth driver across all of our businesses. AI applications are already having a profound impact on the test market, but we are in the very early days of a growth trend that will play out over the coming years. Today, the profit pool generated from AI is concentrated in the build out of cloud AI capabilities, especially for training LLMs on huge data sets. The hardware requirements for training are massive and include general purpose fine grained compute, high bandwidth memory, dense network interconnection, and mammoth amounts of power, all of which are driving our business today. However, these LLMs will only deliver a business impact when they're used to solve problems in the real world. In other words, through inference applications, both in the cloud and at the edge. This is the key opportunity that is driving vertically integrated producers to develop their own devices and will materially affect the complexity of edge processors in automotive, industrial, and mobile applications. While our business is benefiting today from the considerable AI-driven growth in memory, networking, and a few early ramps of vertically integrated producers, our greatest opportunity lies ahead as inference applications and edge AI accelerates because of our strong position with many of the leading providers of mobile and embedding computing in industrial and ADAS applications. AI will also have a profound impact on the robotics industry. Paradigm Robotics has focused on collaborative applications, where robots need to work safely and efficiently in complex environments. AI provides an opportunity to more easily deploy robots that understand and adapt to their surroundings, making them more resilient and expanding the range of problems that they can address. With our layered approach to safety, high product quality, and an open platform ecosystem, UR and MIR are positioned as the preferred robotics platforms for the development of AI manufacturing and logistics solutions. Last month, we announced a collaboration with NVIDIA to utilize their robotics stack on UR hardware and demonstrated the power of that collaboration at GTC with a visual inspection application. Also in the first quarter, we announced the MIR 1200 pallet jack, a new AI powered solution that uses 3D vision to identify, pick up and deliver pallets, even in dynamic and complex environments making it a valuable resource for autonomous material handling in factories and warehouses. Advanced Robotics is just one of the many early examples of edge AI applications positively impacting our business. Others include drive, advanced driver assistance systems and AI capabilities being added to premium tier mobile handsets. Edge AI is becoming a material driver of TAM growth for semi-test, but we're in very early days. We expect AI will be an overarching growth driver for years to come in test as a primary demand driver and in robotics as a key enabler of market growth. We're positioned to benefit from this mega trend and we're investing R&D and field resources to capture this opportunity. Summing up the quarter, we're off to a strong start with Q1 results and our outlook for Q2 well ahead of our view just three months ago. 
the strength and test is focused on cloud and edge AI applications, while other parts of the semiconductor industry work through inventory. Calling the end of these corrections is a challenge, so we're being cautious about our second half outlook. That said, our flexible operations model will enable us to serve upside demand. We expect that industrial, automotive, and mobile will rebound from their current low levels and entirely new demand drivers like AI are already contributing to our test business. The industry's increasing WFE spend in 2024 and 2025 will drive unit volume and device complexity growth, reinforcing our confidence in our midterm outlook. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Sanjay. Sanjay? Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll cover the financial summary of Q1, provide our Q2 outlook, and full year planning assumptions. Now to Q1. First quarter sales were $600 million, which was $10 million above the high end of our guidance with non-GAAP EPS of $0.51, cents, which was above the high end of our guidance of $0.38. Cents. Non-GAAP gross margins were 56.6% above our guidance due to favorable product mix, higher volumes, and improved operational efficiencies. Non-GAAP operating expenses were $251 million, both flat year over year, and up slightly compared to our fourth quarter. Non-GAAP operating profit was approximately 15%. Turning to our revenue breakdown in Q1, semi-test revenue for the quarter was $412 million, with SOC revenue contributing $302 million, and memory, $110 million. In memory, our sales were strongest in DRAM, as AI-driven demand remained strong. Test for HBM is being prioritized by our customers, and we are seeing customers transition capital spending for testers away from flash to DRAM, in part due to HBM and the return of capacity ads and other DRAM tests. Historically, we've seen the split between flash and DRAM markets be more balanced. In system test group, Q1 revenue was $75 million, with $23 million in storage test on low SLT and HDD demand. Recall, SLT has high exposure to the smartphone market, and even as HDD end markets begin to recover, tester capacity utilization rates remain low. In wireless test, revenue was $25 million in Q1, reflecting continued weakness in PC and mobile markets. In Q2, we expect wireless test to improve due to gaming end market and are now beginning to see the ramp of Wi-Fi 7. Now to robotics. Revenue was $88 million as planned, with UR contributing $68 million and MIR $20 million. Shifting to some cash metrics. At a company level, our free cash flow was an outflow of $37 million in the quarter. We typically consume cash in the first quarter as we pay taxes and variable employee compensation. We repurchased $22 million of shares in the quarter and paid $18 million in dividends. We ended the quarter with $871 million in cash and marketable securities. Some other financial information in Q1. We had one 10% customer in the quarter. The tax rate, excluding discrete items for the fourth quarter, was 15% on a GAAP basis and 15.5% on a non-GAAP basis. In Q1, we incurred an FX loss on the fair value of a currency exchange hedge related to the expected investment in Technoprobe. This drove the larger than typical variance between our GAAP and non-GAAP earnings in the quarter. Turning to our current operational environment. In semi-test, supply lead times continue to decline as supply versus demand is more in line. Our lead times continue to hold at one to two quarters. However, in some cases, we have been able to service demand inside these lead times. As a result, our customers are moving back towards historical buying patterns with shorter lead times thus yielding lower second half 2024 visibility consistent with the pre-pandemic environment. Robotics remains a quick turns business and our execution continues to deliver to these market conditions. Now turning to our outlook for Q2. Q2 sales are expected to be between 665 and $725 million with non-GAAP EPS in a range of 64 to 84 cents on 162 million diluted shares. The second quarter guidance excludes the amortization of acquired intangibles and the anticipated gain on the expected sale of DIS, which is $0.29 in our GAAP forecast. 
some color around the forecasted increase to Q2 revenue versus our January view. The increase is driven by our semi-test business where ADAS, compute networking, and HBM demand has strengthened. As noted, this AI strength has continued into the second quarter and some orders initially scheduled for shipment in the third quarter have moved into the second quarter, improving our near-term outlook. Second quarter gross margins are estimated at 57 to 58%. OPEX is expected to run at 36 to 39% of second quarter sales, up modestly from Q1. Non-GAAP operating profit rate at the midpoint of our second quarter guidance is 20%. A few points to assist you in modeling the rest of the year. I'll start with a few more details about the market estimates Greg provided. While our view of the SOC TAM is unchanged in total, under the cover, there are some puts and takes. Compute is up approximately $100 million, while mobile, auto, and industrial are down a little over $100 million in aggregate. In anticipation of questions, let me provide the midpoint of our estimates by segment. Compute, $1.5 billion. Mobile, $0.9 billion. Auto MCU, $0.5 billion. Industrial, $0.3 billion. And service, $0.7 billion, summing up to $3.9 billion for SOC. You'll notice the aggregate decline change has been allocated to the industrial segment. Our memory estimate has increased $200 million with a midpoint of $1.25 billion. Please note our final estimate for the 2023 SOC TAM is $4 billion, up $100 million in the compute segment from our January view. Back to revenue. We expect Q3 sales to be similar to Q2 and Q4 to improve from there. Note that our flattish sequential growth in Q3 does not assume any revenue from DIS. Excluding the impact of the anticipated divestiture, we would expect revenue to grow sequentially in Q3. Our expectation for revenue distribution for the full year is now less back half weighted than our view in January. We currently expect around 47% of the company revenue to be in the first half and 53% in the second half. We expect full year revenue to grow in low single digit range compared to 2023. Now to gross margins. Gross margins are expected to continue to improve as we progress through the year and should be at our target gross margin model for the fourth quarter. Full year gross margins will likely be in the 58 to 59% range, unchanged from our January outlook. Regarding OPEX for the full year, we expect full year 2024 OPEX to grow 5 to 7% consistent with prior guide as we continue to make engineering and go-to-market investments. Our GAAP and non-GAAP tax rate, excluding discrete items, are forecasted to be 15 to 15.5% respectively in 2024. A quick update on our previously announced strategic partnership with Technopro. As a reminder, the agreement has several key components. First, Technopro will purchase Teradyne's DIS business, which provides advanced interfaces that connect our testers to customers' chips for test. Second, Teradyne will make an equity investment in Technoprobe, acquiring 10% of the company. Third, Teradyne and Technoprobe will, will work together on a series of projects to expand the performance of semiconductor device interfaces to enable customers to realize the full performance of our test systems. We continue to expect the transactions to close in the second quarter. DIS revenue contribution for the first quarter was approximately $21 million. Post-closing, our cash position will decline as the transaction is expected to consume an estimated $440 million of net cash. We will continue to limit our share buybacks in 2024 to an amount necessary to offset dilution from equity compensation and our employee share purchase program in order to build cash back to a minimum goal of $800 million. Summing up, we delivered sales and earnings above the high end of our guidance range as memory and networking exceeded our plan in semi-test, mainly driven by AI. The mobile, industrial, and legacy auto markets remain soft. Our robotics team delivered to plan for the third consecutive quarter, as we continue to execute our new product development and go-to-market strategies. Overall, visibility beyond the second quarter is limited 
given the increased level of turns business in semi-test. Our first quarter performance and the improvement in our second quarter outlook elevates our confidence for the year. Midterm fundamentals remained intact, yielding continued optimism beyond 2024. With that, I'll turn the call back to Tracy. Tracy? Thanks. Can we open up to questions? Thank you. We will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your questions from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. The first question comes from the line of Mehdi Hosseini with SIG. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. Thanks for taking my question. To follow up, uh, it seems to me that uh, despite the fact that you highlighted mobile as an area of weakness, it had already been dialed into your January um, um, a guide or commentary for the full year. Um, would, that, would, that, would that be fair? Uh, yes, it would, Betty. Okay. So, and this brings up what I want to really ask you. When I look at uh, TSMC, um, they just announced their annual report, and obviously um, uh, Apple uh, mix of revenue went up. And I'm using that as a kind of a trying to better understand the dynamics. So if 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 TSMC is running uh, or generating more revenues, that means more uh, chips uh, for that particular customer is coming out. Um, and at some point, utilization rate for those testers are going to hit that 85, 90% threshold. Um, and, and I'm trying to like look beyond the next couple of quarters. Are we thinking, are you also um, thinking that at some point in the next two to four quarter, those utilization rates are going to get to the point where uh, even if uh, that particular customer of TSM were to continue with kind of bifurcation of their technology now, would they would they still have to come back to the market and buy more testers? Hi, Mehdi. This is Greg. Um, I think you've got it. Uh, you've got it right that um, uh, utilization is continuing to increase. Um, the uh, the equipment that is in place is being used quite efficiently uh, through the year, um, so the the loading is is relatively constant, um, and uh, we we definitely believe that uh, it's a matter of when, not if. Uh, there's going to be a need for significant additional capacity, uh, you know, uh, to support that kind of product line. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Vivek Arya with Bank of America Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, on the compute TAM, the 1.5 billion, um, I think that's up roughly 15% from last year. When I look at the size of the accelerator market uh, this year, it's supposed to double. So is that you know, one kind of high-level way to look at how much the accelerator market is growing versus how much your tester uh, compute time is uh, growing? Um, or, or if, or is there a different way? So, for example, if let's say the accelerator market grows 30% next year, right, what what does that imply for your compute time? Uh, so, uh, interesting question. There's, um, you know, it, thinking about the TAM, that is the, the overall size of the market, uh, you know, so what, what we would get, what our competitor would get. Um, and the, the size of the accelerator market has gone up a lot this year. Most of the testers to support this year's revenue in accelerators was put in place last year. You know, so um, if, uh, if that, if a, uh, you know, the, the TAM that was supported last year, supporting the, the, that sort of big growth that we've seen in the end market this year, what's going to happen this year, the, the 1.5 that we talked about is going to support a significant increase again next year. 
Um, and that, you know, this year the the primary beneficiary in terms of that uh, end market is um, NVIDIA. Uh, what we're seeing now is that we are having some uh, vertically integrated producers uh, start to have significant ramps, and they're already loading significant numbers of testers. The, the TAM in 2024 for compute is actually a little bit constrained below what it would otherwise be because the, uh, these new entrants are actually able to um, work with their, uh, their OSAT partners and convert idle testers that would have been in mobile into the, into the compute space. Uh, so right now the loading of compute testers is higher than it was um, than what you'd see in terms of the buys in the market. As mobile starts to come back, uh, that means that there's less idle capacity to fill. It also means that the, the compute market is going to be translated into more direct buys. It, and Vec, just a quick comment. Um, in my prepared remarks, we noted that the our, our estimate was revised for 2023 for the compute market. When I do the math of our midpoint of 1.5 billion and 24 versus our old, uh, you do get a 15% increase, but we revised that in my prepared remarks, I noted to 1.4 billion. So I think the growth is 7% versus uh, 15. Just wanted to point that out. Oh, got it. Thank, uh, thank you. And just a quick follow-up. You know, a number of your WFE peers have started to see the benefits of uh, two nanometer and gate all around. I'm wondering what does that mean for uh, Teradyne? Uh, when will you start to see those uh, benefits? And you know, how, uh, what does that mean for uh, tester intensity? I assume that's more 25 or, or 26. You know, any color around that would be very useful. Thank you. Sure, so um, we are expecting to see uh, some testers being used to support the engineering work in early, uh, early parts in two nanometer, probably towards the end of 2025. We don't expect any volume associated with two nanometer gate all around until 2026. And the way that we're looking at that right now is that uh, there's nothing particularly idiosyncratic about that node in terms of tester, tester demand. So we're thinking of it primarily as an enabler to uh, more complex parts. There are a lot, of, a lot of parts, for example, for cloud AI training, that at this point are actually radical limited, and they're, uh, you know, and so anything to allow increased complexity within the same die size is likely to be soaked up by AI. And so uh, the 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 faster that two nanometer comes online, the faster these more complex parts will be um, developed, and those will likely have longer test times, higher test intensity, which will drive the TAM. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Toshi Ahari with Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for taking the question. I had one question on, on memory and another one on, on your VIP business. Um, on the memory side, you guys talked about a $1.25 billion TAM for 24. Um, I was hoping you could provide a rough split between DRAM and NAND, how you're viewing the market. Um, you know, what, what the contri contribution could be fr from HBM. And if you can speak to your competitive position, your market share position within HBM, that would be helpful. Sure, why don't I take the, the numbers and maybe um, the competitive position, Greg, if you wanna take. So, so the split, um, so the range that we provided uh, was 1.2 billion to 1.3 billion with a midpoint of 1.25 billion. And we think from a DRAM perspective, that's it's roughly 80% of um, of that versus a uh, flash of of uh, twenty, you know historically um, that you know I would say DRAM has been in the forties and fifty percent fifty percent of of the overall memory market. So so that's roughly the split. And then HBM, look, um, we think is. Yeah, we, we, we think it's, yeah, we think that number's about 500 million 
it's going to work the percent, but we think that number is about 500 million out of the out of the 1.25 billion. So, in terms of competitive position, um, the the share patterns that have existed uh, for a few years are persisting. We have very high share in uh, flash final test. We have strong share position in DRAM final test, and we have uh, a lower share position in um, uh, both flash wafer sort and DRAM wafer sort. Um, so what's happening in the memory market? Uh, like last year, there was a, a lot of technology-driven buys that were pushing uh, final test purchases. This year, the, 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 the spark is coming back to the memory market, and that is driving the need for more capacity, and that is driving wafer sort purchases. So um, there's no customer uh, losses, but we are expecting to see our share come down a little bit this year as those uh, wafer sort capacity buys go in. Now, the, the sub, subtext underneath that is uh, HBM is a, uh, is a wafer level technology. So all of the test for HBM falls into that wafer sort space. And um, in, in HBM, last year we had about 50% of the, of the test TAM for HBM. This year we're expecting that that, uh, that, that is going to come down modestly um, in terms of share. Our revenue is going to be up significantly, but the market is five times bigger. So our share is probably going to float down a little bit as the you know a, as people begin to tool up uh, next generation you know, for the the volume expansion in HBM. At the same time, we think that our opportunities for share gain in terms of new test insertions for HBM are quite good, and so we're projecting that we're going to be penetrating new customers and new test steps for that this year. Great. Uh, thank you for all the details. And then as my follow-up on, on the VIP side, um, you know, we, we, we've all seen quite a few announcements from, you know, the Googles, the, the Amazons, the Metas of the world uh, in terms of what they're working on. I, I'm curious um, when those announcements kind of translate into revenue for, for you guys. Um, you know, I know it takes time for, for, for those projects to ramp, um, but I, I think you have pretty good visibility as, as a test provider. You're probably pulled into those projects early. So is it a 25 dynamic? Is it 26? And, and how should we think about that contribution um, as some of those projects ramp? Thank you. Well, from a vertically integrated producer perspective, um, it really kind of started back in like 2022, 2023. Um, in 2024, like right now, there are hundreds of testers that are being used to test VIP source parts for us, um, and probably a similar number from our competitor. So it has happened. The, the thing that hasn't happened because of the, the, the low utilization driven by the mobile slowdown, that hasn't translated to as much new tester purchases as we would have expected in a, in a stronger market. Um, but the, you know, we have uh, multiple VIP sockets that are loading more than 50 testers each, um, and we have a pipeline of new design starts that we are plan of record for that will stretch out all the way into 2026. So this is, this is real. Um, it's, it's happening now, but the impact on our financial results has been uh, muted by the low utilization because of the mobile downturn. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of C. Demuse with Cantor Fitzgerald. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good morning. Thank you for taking the question. I guess first question, you know, Greg, in your prepared remarks, you talked about, you know, cautiousness on, on the second half, though seeing, you know, greater uh, upside opportunity than downside risk. So we was hoping to uh, dig deeper into that, if you could share you know, what would be the end markets that, that could be upward surprise, you know, as we progress through the year? So um, we're, we have limited visibility. So I'm you know, like, just bear in mind that I'm going into the realm of speculation here. Um, the things that could drive a higher second half is um, 
the leading edge of some sort of a recovery in mobile. Um, right now we have of a pretty low baseline baked into our plan. So essentially any uh, capacity of shortfalls um, would immediately turn into business. And then the other is uh, we've seen such a uh, dramatic strengthening in the compute segment with very short lead times in Q1. Um, you know, so that's, that's what really drove our um, increased outlook for Q2. Um, the, so there's, we didn't see it coming. Uh, we, we, we actually, you know, we had hints that it was coming. We thought it would be further out and smaller. It has come in bigger and uh, faster than we expected. If that trend were to continue, then we'd see continued strengthening in the compute space. And that's another thing that could drive uh, a second half up. Very helpful. And, and as I think the other way to question. think about that is we, we, don't, we don't really think that industrial automotive is going to significantly strengthen in the year. That's more of a 2025 thing. Very helpful. Um, as a follow up, you, you talked briefly on Edge AI. Um, and so I was curious to hear your thoughts on how you see uh, you know, that uh, play out in, in the smart for arena. It sounds like this is a year where, you know, everyone is trying to see what sticks and what use cases uh, and that maybe next year is, is the year. Would, would love to, you know, hear whether you agree with that assessment. Um, when you think the earliest uh, we could see, you know, increased content uh, to support edge AI and smartphones and, you know, how, how you see that playing out and impacting Teradyne's best business. Thank you. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a great question. We've, we've been having uh, very rich discussions internally about this to try and figure out when you consider a smartphone to be AI enabled. And we're, we're thinking about it in terms of the complexity of the processor that goes into the phone. Um, you know, there have been neural processing units and AI features in phones for, for years. Uh, but now uh, the AI... Um, opportunity, the edge AI opportunity is driving things towards, uh, you know, pushing the amount of silicon area used for AI up towards like 50% or 50 or, or a third of the silicon area going into that. So those types of processors are just starting to hit the market now the, at the premium tier. And uh, there is I think we've got about a year of people trying to figure out what kind of customer features will actually be, be, be compelling using that. Um, and right now, there aren't that many of them. I think that that's what's going to happen during the rest of 2024, that there's some premium smartphones and some, some uh, people that are trying to innovate the things to do with them. I think the processor generation that's really going to start having enough power to do LLM stuff on a phone is probably the stuff that would ramp towards the end of 2025, and it would become much more mainstream in the generation of silicon coming out in 26. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Samik Chatterjee with JP Morgan Chase. Please go ahead. Yep. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Maybe uh, just to stick with the mobile um, ecosystem a bit, and uh, any sort of change in your thinking about the primary smartphone customer there? Um, I know you've said previously it's less than 10 percent is what your expectation for this year is. Just checking in terms of how much of the sort of change in 2Q or sort of thinking about the back half, any changes in how you think about the cadence of purchases from primary customer or any change in your overall thinking for the year for that customer? Can I have a follow-up? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I, I, I hope I caught all of your question. If I didn't, then uh, uh, please correct me. Um, we, we don't comment about specific customers. Um, I, will, I will share that um, we don't expect that our historically largest customer will be a 10% customer this year. Um, I'll also share that we, um, we think that there is um, more of that, that, that we've got sort of the bottom dialed into our plan, that there's definitely more upside to downside in terms of the, the plan associated with, with mobile in general. Got it, got it. No, and you got that question. So uh, for my follow-up,
Gulab, if I can ask on robotics, uh, can you give us some sense of how you're thinking about first half versus second half there, and what what's the right now any updated thinking on profitability for the year for the the business? How how did it track in one Q and sort of how you're thinking about the full year for robotics? Thank you. So I'll I'll start off with sort of a qualitative qualitative answer in terms of the drivers. Um, but then I'll pass it off to Sanjay to give you um, more of the precise split, first half, second half, and the profitability. So what, what's going on right now is um, we have a, a plan for the year that's going to be essentially sequentially growing quarter by quarter. Um, and the reason that the plan is laid out that way is because there are new growth drivers that are coming online um, throughout the year. Uh, there are uh, drivers that are in place in, from last year in Q1. That's specifically the UR20 and UR30, the heavy payload cobots. In Q1, um, we had the announcement of the Mir 1200 pallet jack. That's going to start really impacting revenue in the back half, um, primarily in the fourth quarter. But we're already taking orders. We're building backlog for that product. Um, we also announced the... Um, the, the collaboration with NVIDIA, that's going to really drive business through our OEM solution channel. So we're going to be providing the platform tools to that channel so that they can create stuff that goes to market. So that's, that's stuff that will also be back half loaded. Um, the, the other thing that's driving through the year is we are continuing to build our OEM channel and our large accounts channel. So those are uh, things that we started we started OEMs back in 22. We started large accounts in 23, and they have a significant amount of uh, gestation time before they deliver revenue. We're right at the point where um, where uh, OEMs are starting to really click. We talked about the 58% year-on-year increase in that space. Um, I'm expecting to see uh, growth above the aggregate growth for large accounts in 2024, so that's going to be a growth driver through the end of the year. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Sanjay to give you sort of the precise the, the precise breakdowns. Sure. Thanks, Greg. So um, roughly the first half of the year, is, well, first, as Greg noted, we expect to grow sequentially in Q2, and we expect to grow throughout the year for the, the reasons Greg just noted. But the first half, we have, you know, 42 percentage plus or minus and then you know, 58% in the back half of the year. Um, we do expect to be profitable this year, um, I would say over the year, and I would say that that would be a single digit profitability. Um, I will comment, I think you asked about Q1. Um, we, were, we were not profitable just given the, the seasonality of the, of the quarter, but that should you know, give you the context, I think that you asked. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Krish Sankar with TD Cohen. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank, thanks for taking my question. I had a couple of them. First one, um, on the memory side, how much of your memory revenues were from HVM in the March quarter? And I think Sanjay mentioned HVM revenues could grow 5x um, this year. I'm kind of curious, are you over-indexed to one customer? Because my understanding is of the three HVM customers, one of them in sources, and within the other two, can you just talk a little bit about your share position there? Then I had a follow up. So I'll take the I'll take the first one on the on the memory in the quarter. Yeah. So I want to say um, roughly about forty five percent of the of the memory revenue that we had was tied in the first quarter to uh, to HBM. Um, what were the other? Over index to one customer. Yes. Yeah, so I'll I'll take the so. Um, uh, Chris, one one quick comment. The the five X comment about HBM was referring to the market size for HBM memory. So last year was about a hundred million dollars of TAM for HBM. This year we think it's about five hundred million dollars worth of TAM for HBM. Um, our our revenue is not going to go up by a factor of five. It's going to go up. It's going to go up significantly, but um, it's it's not we're not going to be able to hold sort of the 50-ish 50 percent share of HBM that we had last year. Um, are we over-indexed to one customer? Well, 
the entire world is significantly over-indexed to one supplier in HBM. And that certainly has been driving our results um, to a, a great degree both last year and will continue to drive our results this year. Um, the other suppliers that are coming online, uh, one of them is, uh, you know, is primarily uh, internally based for test. We don't have any of that baked into our plan, um, although we're, uh, you know, we, we think that they would be better off using our equipment. Uh, we haven't convinced them of that yet. Um, and the other, potent the other supplier in this space is, uh, you know, is a great customer of ours, um, although our share there is lower than our share in the leader in this space right now. So that's another reason that we expect to dilute our share a little bit this year. The other point that I'll make is, you know, I, I was uh, saying that we, we like our chances in terms of getting into new insertions for HBM memory this year. Um, I think that that's, a, that's an important point. Um, and uh, we are hopeful that that's going to be delivering um, uh, significantly higher revenue for us through the midterm. Very helpful, very helpful. And then just a quick follow-up. You spoke about your revenue trajectory through the year. You said, um, you know, September should be similar to June and then growth in 4Q. I'm very curious because that seems to be against normal seasonality. So what's the deviation this year? Yeah, uh, interesting question. I'd say that, you know, I, I remember several years back where we talked about we were going into a downturn, and that downturn was four to six quarters. And the downturn has, has gone a lot longer in the way of mobility. And, and as Greg noted, you know, we believe that we've, we've um, our, our forecast considers mobility at, at a point where we feel comfortable that it's going to be achieved. And so I think as things pick back up, um, you know, the historical seasonality, I just, you know, I put it in the context of, you know, some segments are, are, we're, are, po are going to be recovering and we have some new segments that are, or some segments that are growing um, fairly well. So I, I think the seasonality comment with regards to the test perspective uh, or, or test part portfolio of businesses we have, um, it's a little bit off this year. Well, I, I think there's, uh, this is Greg, just one additional bit of color. Um, if you think about the seasonality pattern that we developed really, you know, for a decade, you know, 2010 through 2021, that seasonality, if you looked at all of our segments with the exception of mobile, there wasn't, there wasn't a really marked seasonality. You know, uh, like those automotive, compute, industrial, they kind of chugged along. The, the seasonality was really driven by the mobile TAM, and that was driven by consumer buying behavior, right? That you needed to have things for the, for the holiday season, both, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, for uh, Lunar New Year, that all of that inventory needed to be built up. And so the, there was a concentration of capacity that would go in in Q2 and Q3 with mobile not, not driving right now the seasonality is very, very muted. So I would expect to see that the seasonality will return once the mobile market is stronger, but I don't think you can use normal patterns to predict the way things will look in 24. Got it, got it, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Joe Moore with Morgan Stanley, please go ahead. Yeah. Great, thank you. I wonder if you could talk to the smartphone issues that you just mentioned. Uh, away from your biggest customer, you sort of saw all the smartphone suppliers reduce balance sheet inventory by 15, 20 days in Q4, and they talked about doing that again in Q1. So I would expect you to have low visibility, but couldn't you get some recovery as they stop depleting that much inventory? Is there any kind of nuance in terms of how much of that inventory has been tested already in Dybank, things like that? Uh, but, you know, shouldn't we have some optimism that this is going to get better? Well, I think uh, we, we certainly have optimism that it can get better. Um, and that's basically because we've dialed in the bottom. Um, the, uh, and, you know, when you, the way we do this is we typically will look at um, tester utilization numbers. And frankly, those numbers are all over the map. Some indicators show that that capacity is tightening other indicators are showing that it's relatively uh, – uh, utilization is, is tightening. Others show that it's, it's relatively flat. 
our qualitative checks, when we are talking to people in the, in the ecosystem, they are, um, they're telling us that capacity is getting, that utilization is getting tighter and it's forecast to get even, you know, it's, it's forecast to go up from there. So the thing that that hasn't done it is, is it hasn't turned into firm forecast for additional business. And there is a, a fair amount of, uh, you know, I think the lack of visibility that we see, it runs all the way through the supply chain, that, the, that people are wondering what's going to happen. People are wondering how well handset sales will recover. And I think it's, it's really going to come down to the way that the, the holiday season demand is shaping up. That's the thing that's going to be the lever that either turns on some additional spot buys or will have people waiting until 2025. Very helpful context. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Brian Chin with Stiefel. Please go ahead. Hi there. Um, thanks for, for taking the, the, the questions. Um, just to, to clarify, maybe firstly, was the, the third quarter pull-in, was that for AI, compute, or for compute or for memory or, or for both? And j just to be clear, uh, uh, your share of the 200 million memory TAM increase is it, is, is, should we think about that being closer to say you know 40 percent? The emphasis is, is on wafer sort, and, and kind of sorry, one more part to this, but I, I didn't catch this earlier. But if HBM demand is is biased to a single cu customer, do you expect memory sales to be lumpy this year, kind of from a, a quarterly perspective? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the um, I'll take the uh, kind of the Q3 to Q2. Um, it was. I'd say mainly in compute and um, and some ADAS, but was um, that's accelerated. And and um, just looking up something. Oh uh, yeah. So in in terms of the the TAM increase, uh, we we moved the TAM up by uh, two hundred million, um, and I think. I think your guess of 40 million is a bit low. I think we'll be up a bit more than, you know, we'll get a larger chunk of that up than, than that, probably in line with our historical share level, you know, kind of 35 to 40% of that TAM increase should probably go to us. In terms of lumpy sales, no, I think actually the, the memory business is um, uh, driving, you know, that we have, we have deliveries that will be stretching out through the year, um, and I think the demand is relatively steady and potentially increasing. So I think on a quarterly basis, we don't expect a lot of memory variation. Okay, that, yeah, that's helpful. And then, you know, switching gears to robotics, you're, it seems like your omni-channel and, and new product focus is driving a lot of this uh, improved momentum in that business. But can you also just touch on the, the broader environment you're seeing in robotics and wh where, if any, you see sort of macro like headwinds or tailwinds? And, and, and last part of that, um, you know, what, what vertical or application was that customer that placed the, the record mirror order? And th did that include any of the, the, the mirror 1200s? Okay. So um, uh, in terms of the, the macro environment, it's pretty weak. I mean, it was weak throughout 2023, and um, we don't see a significant improvement right now in terms of the end market conditions. If you look at PMIs, they, uh, some regions are clicking up slightly, but uh, we haven't really seen that turned into uh, like a hot market. Having said that, we are um, – we're in a part of the robotics market that is very, very low penetration. Um, and so we're not, uh, you know, we, we have seen our business results vary with the macro conditions. And we think that that is indicative of the, the that, that was one of the things that drove us to go make the changes in terms of adding new products and, and driving channel development, because we think we're 5% of the way into something that could be huge. And if we're if that's the if that's the case, then we should be somewhat immune to these cycles. But if you look, we've been looking at um, 
uh, like industrial robot competitors, and their their results this quarter have been pretty meager. They're, like especially if you look at their incoming order rates, which is more um, comparable. We like they have long lead lot lead times. We have short lead times. So it's better for us to compare their orders to our orders. We feel like we are doing far better than they are in these end market conditions. Um, but we're really focused on kind of controlling our own destiny by finding the things that need need support, even when the end market is. One thing that I'll say is looking at um, other sort of industrial analyst notes and talking to people in that space, they are expecting uh, improved strength. Uh, like they, they think that things are going to get better, um, not worse. So I'm I'm optimistic that we're going to have some macro tailwinds in addition to the the plan that we baked that's kind of counting on things staying around where they are. Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Next question comes from the line of Gus Richard with Nordland Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, thanks for taking my question and uh, congratulations on the results. Um, on the uh, industrial automation, you've got a partnership with NVIDIA on AI, and sort of one of the limiters to penetration is the lack of a VAR channel, having to have to work with people to, to implement this stuff. Does multimodal AI or AI in general sort of simplify the implementation? Can you simplify the programming implementation of robotics with, with that infusion of AI? Uh, yes. So for sure, the, um, the, the great thing about AI, there are two primary benefits to AI. One is that it's far easier to design a solution that is um, able to deal with variation, you know, whether it's part variation or location variation or other, other uncertainties that exist in normal manufacturing environments, the solutions end up being far more resilient. So that's that means that more people would be willing to adopt them. That it's like they, people don't want to put fragile things into production and AI will help make things more robust. The ease, the, the simplicity of developing things is definitely a, uh, a huge benefit of AI. So um, the, the demonstration that we did at GTC um, was, a, was a pretty sophisticated visual inspection application. And because we were leveraging a, a really powerful AI stack from NVIDIA, we were able to put that together in less than two weeks. You know, it was a, it was a, a very fast turnaround to be able to build that solution. And we expect that um, both customers and customers and especially solution providers are going to be able to leverage that and create um, uh, solutions to categories of problems that will help drive growth. Got it, thanks. And then on the semi-test side, you've got uh, sort of, it's gonna be a while before we get to two nanometers. Yields at three, I don't think we're that great. Um, and the, you know, AI accelerators are radical limited. Um, you know, how are you seeing the um, expansion of use of chiplets, you know, sort of beyond AI accelerators and servers and FPGAs? Is, is that beginning to, to broaden out? Not really. I mean, the the uh, well, one one thing is that um, most of the advanced packaging capacity in the world has been consumed by the people who are doing cloud AI, high performance computing. So there's a uh, uh, you know there's more demand than there is supply for it. So I think that's limiting it to the markets that are willing to pay the most for the ability to do it. Um, I think that it's possible that chiplet technology will migrate out of high performance computing. Um, potentially, I mean, it, it could potentially migrate into uh, some mobile applications. I think that's going to be a relatively slow process because the price points are very, very different. And then I think for uh, industrial and automotive AI applications, it's likely to be a long time before you see chiplet technology in there because of the reliability and temperature range questions. It's a much more challenging environment to try and put packages. But that's, that's kind of my view. I think there, that there are people that have a more aggressive view in terms of where chiplets will go. 
Got it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one last question. Uh, the next question comes from the line of Steve Bajor with KeyBank Capital Markets. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks. I'll be quick. Um, Greg, you said share gain opportunities in HBM are good. Is that primarily due to you having capacity to support a fast-growing addressable market, or is there something unique in your current or future testers that will make you a supplier of choice for some variations of HBM? I think it's definitely the latter. You know, so we have, uh, we believe we have a differentiated solution, both in terms of ability to support data rates out through uh, HBM4, um, and also in terms of uh, being able to use the uh, same platform across multiple insertions. So we think that we have uh, an ability to deliver more cost-effective uh, performance tests of HBM, and uh, we believe that we're going to we're going to make some progress there. Understood. And for the the large account channel in robotics, you said there's a gestation time before revenue. Was this largest ever mere order a function of work prior done to the pivot, or did it come after? And, and then to your point about being more immune to cycles, is that just because large accounts are more likely to invest through cycles and and are less swayed by near term conditions? Um, yeah, so let me let me take the uh, um, the large account question first, and and I need to apologize to Brian because I didn't answer his question before. So um, the largest order that we've ever gotten from Mir, it came from an automotive customer, um, and it is uh, also our historically largest customer for um, for Mir. Um, by you know, by no coincidence, it's also a significantly large customer for UR. So we have been selling them robots for a long time. The one thing that has happened since we uh, since we established our large account effort is that we've been applying uh, many of the the strategic account management techniques that we've been using for decades in semiconductor tests towards uh, addressing those accounts and really organizing ourselves around the way that those large accounts acquire uh, new equipment and also how to take care of the equipment that they have. So I think um, it's certainly a, an account that predated that effort, but I think our ability to serve that account has improved with this effort. And then just about being more immune to cycles, is that because large accounts will invest through cycles, and so that pivot will make you less cyclical yourself? I think actually the, the large accounts may be the, the segment that has um, – that will continue to be – uh, sensitive to end market conditions because large accounts will work off of budget budgets and if they don't provide budgets for automation then that will, those purchases won't happen. Um, the thing that we're really trying to do is <clears throat> make sure that we are adding enough uh, enough new opportunities um, to uh, drive growth even if end market conditions are weak. So a key part of this is being able to find and um, find and, and serve customers that have these problems. We have 95% of this market that is as yet unserved. So there is uh, plenty of opportunity. And the key thing that we're trying to do is to pick our shots, pick the specific industry verticals and the specific applications that are likely to be driving growth independent of the, the aggregate macro conditions. Understood. Thanks very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of question and answer session. I would now like to turn the floor over to Tracy Suchiguchi for closing comments. Great. Thank you all for joining us this morning for our first quarter earnings call. We look forward to being in touch with you all uh, through the course of the quarter. Thank you. Good day. Thank you. This concludes today's teleconference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your partnership.